going back, back and forth from experience with a person and also being living in, in the, the United States. So and how that different paradigm is always being reasons and um, you know how I think the basic denial of the indigenous thinking process is always taking a second, you know, second seat. And uh, so we're here to maybe change that or bring notation to the system that has basically put us in communities where radio stations across the United States uh, did a survey about five years ago where there was only 43 native-owned radio stations. But of those 43 native-owned radio stations, they were really native-owned. 37 of them were owned by Christian organizations. Therefore, it had, they had a lot of influence and a lot of people would, would contact you here. And the only time that you would hear anything um, that made it would probably be late at night or early in the morning, which is true of a lot of community stations. Um, you hear places maybe 2 a.m. in the morning or, or uh, very early in the morning where you don't really hear native people. And if you do hear something, it's more of an NPR-ish take, a very soft sound. Okay, we can accept native people who are dancing and, and playing food and saying all the nice things that we need political and really sticking to how we are defending the land and, and being real with that. So uh, that's just a little bit about what I'd like to talk about today. And I know Kehlani has a lot to talk about as being one of the sole producers and hosts of the public radio uh, program in, in uh, Wesleyan University. It's called Indigenous Politics from Native New England and Beyond. And for the last six years, she's been doing this and produced in those studios and the syndicated down the stations across the country and, and, and through Pacific Radio uh, Network. And uh, she's going to discuss some things as, as a producer and a programmer. And it, it's, I like to emphasize that it's very different being, you know, that through the years that I've only had a few people willing to stick with this different subject of Native peoples or Indigenous peoples' um, perspective. Because after a while it became too heavy and too hard for them, so they would back off. And so I've had several people host and or, uh, I would say, uh, interns that would only be able to handle it so much because you have to deal with the reality of Papal Bulls of 1492, which I am sure John will, will get to. And uh, it's a lot of history. And Kailani will talk about the, the ethical relational relationship from Hawaii, where she's from, to Turtle Island, and her experiences and travels in Palestine. So it's really going to be, I think, if you pay attention to this, then the politics of the 21st century, the government's attempts to remove indigenous peoples from our lands, and from corporate resource extraction, ranging from oil, and uh, minerals, and water, and relation to contemporary legislation, um, basically it's called all caused by genocidal implications. And uh, so she will speak to this, mobilizing the economic, political transformation, and uh, the broad-based resistance to this. So, and I'm telling you, thank you very much. I'll just go to the podium more so I can pick up the audio, um, plug in over here. Good afternoon, everyone. Aloha, Thank you for attending. I know there's a lot of sessions on the books. Appreciate being um, I want to start by acknowledging this is Lenape territory and acknowledge the sovereignty of the Lenape people. Uh, this is an ethnically cleansed territory, Manhattan, and uh, those tribes have been reconstituted as far as Wisconsin, Canada, Oklahoma. Someone's budding into your business, you can say that's not your kuleana. 
but it also means it's not your responsibility or your right or your, your business. And so part of that is knowing our own purview and our own obligations and sense of relationality. Um, as Teo Kristen introduced me, I'm the sole uh, producer and host of Indigenous Politics for Native Women and Beyond. I've been on air since February 2007. I'm an associate professor at Wesleyan University, and I got the call from the public affairs director of the station in the fall of 2006 asking if I would like to do a Native show. And I said yes immediately, not knowing really exactly what I was going to get myself into, but I always wanted to be a music teacher in grad school, so I thought this will be one way in. And um, I've been on the air uh, almost continuously. I took a, a hiatus, a brief hiatus last year, but at least we've been running since February 2007. All my shows are archived online at indigenouspolitics.com if you want to check it out. Although there's a .com, it's, it's, it's calm, but it's totally free. And I also do the show as a volunteer. I don't get paid any money. I've never received a cent for doing the show. It's a Wesleyan owned station, but it is part of the Pacifica Radio Network. Don't get it, it's it. And only, and only a third of the budget, uh, operating budget, comes from the university. Uh, the rest is mostly raised from community listeners, and then there's some that get um, brokered through other stations that we partner with where some NPR programs are aired. Um, but that's basically less than a third of our programming on, on the radio station itself. Um, I want to just also be really clear, I'm not a journalist, I'm also not a pundit. I took on the show, um, the, the subtitle from Native New England and Beyond was to ground myself and to understand whose land I'm on. I'm a Native Hawaiian woman, Kanaka Maoli. I'm living on Wayne Hunt territory. Everywhere we are in, in, in Turtle Island and throughout America, this is Native land. And when I first moved to that region in 2000 to take up my teaching position, there was already a really strong current of anti-Indian policy emanating from the state of Connecticut, from the Democrats who were intervening at the federal level in terms of federal recognition for tribes in the New England region seeking federal recognition. And so by the time I went on here many years later, I thought my primary kuleana would be to actually acknowledge the struggles in the region where I was residing, where I do reside, but the and beyond allows for a global scope, so it's very flux. And because I'm not a journalist and I am an advocate, and it's also this is my primary area of research and what I teach. I teach Native sovereignty politics. I teach on U.S. colonialism in the Pacific. Um, I teach on issues related to race and indigeneity and, and a class called colonialism and its consequences. I also want to just mention I have an anarchist show that I do with a group called Horizontal Power Hour, and I'm also going to be teaching a new course on anarchism. I'm interested in uh, the ways that anarchism and anarchist thought interacts with indigenous thought and principles. Um, but so in terms of saying I'm not a journalist or a pundit, but not being a journalist, I'm very forthright about being an advocate. It's a pro-sovereignty show. Uh, there's no hidden questions for people. Um, I've talked to tribal leaders and activists who tell me what's sensitive, what they might not be able to discuss because of legal issues, for example, what their own priorities are, what they want me to emphasize, and they're responsive when it comes to that. I'm also not a pundit. I'm not talking a lot. I'm asking a lot of questions. I tend to do a lot of research beforehand. And part of the phenomenon that I see is to actually especially target non-Indigenous listeners to uh, unpack really what can be understood by many as complicated legal issues into lay terms so that people understand their own social, political, and legal location vis-a-vis -vis indigenous peoples, whether they're federally recognized or not, and to understand uh, not just the legal issues and battles and fights and resistances, but also to understand what it means for many people to actually engage indigeneity as a category of analysis and indigenous peoples as nations. Uh, when they are by and large living on land that they actually don't belong to in terms of that indigenous claim. Um, I want to talk more about the, the summary that uh, Teo Kusuna read, but before I launch into that, I want to acknowledge two people who are in the room who have been guests on my show. I've met one before in person, Kent Lebsack, and I see um, Deborah White Plume sitting in the audience who I've not met in person. I just saw your name tag, and I recognize your photo from the media. I do a lot of phone interviews because I'm doing it in the booth at the station in Middletown, Connecticut, and I'm really, really happy you're here. Um, so one of the things that I try and get at that I want to make the link to in terms of the conference theme, mobilizing, 
for economic slash ecological transformation is what Patrick Wolf calls the logic of elimination that's inherent to settler colonialism. Uh, people on the left are, tend to be very familiar with the concept of colonialism, uh, whether they take it up in their analyses is another issue altogether, but when they talk about colonialism, by and large, they are talking about franchise colonialism without marking it as such. And franchise colonialism is the example that I use is, is England in India, which is very different than England in Turtle Island. Right? Settler colonialism is about replacing indigenous peoples, it's about settling land, it's about occupying land, and as Patrick Wolfe theorizes, the centerpiece is land expropriation. And to actually expropriate that land, it's about the logic of the elimination of the native. That doesn't always have to include genocide, but we know from this context throughout the Americas that it has, and it continues to. Uh, XL, Keystone XL pipeline that I've interviewed um, Deborah Wyatt came about and Kent Lebsock, who's talked about the Lakota Treaty Project. I see their work, their work is literally stemming ongoing genocidal practices in the 21st century. Um, in terms of the ongoing logics, elimination can happen through other measures of people who have survived frontier violence, frontier homicide. So, blood quantum policies, that's all part of the logic and practice and policy of elimination. Uh, the erasure, the way that discursively people here say that they're a native New Yorker. That's still part of the logic of elimination. <coughs> native New Yorker, really? Are you the Nape? You know, are you one of the Carcery tribes or one of the other uh, Muncie band, right? So when people say native New Yorker or I'm a native Californian, so really what tribe? Oh no, I'm born and raised there. I mean, that's all about, that's nativism, right? That's not indigeneity, that's na it's not native. It's nativism. It's all about replacing the indigenous. And it's about indigenizing oneself as a settler. And it's also about insinuating oneself in the land. It's like a bad grafting job. There's no genealogy, right? So with the logics of settler colonialism, this is really, for, for us to even begin to talk about economic or ecological transformation, we have to acknowledge economic and ecological devastation. But we live in a settler colonial society. We are right now embedded in a settler colonial society. And genealogically, politically speaking, historically speaking, legally speaking, it stems back to settler colonialism. Right? So you have Occupy Wall Street um, doing really radical politics, talking about the 99%. You had indigenous peoples immediately question the concept of the term Occupy in that movement. And a lot of people, I think, misheard it as some nitpicking political correctness, superficiality, or nomenclature, rather than understanding that it's a radical critique of what it means to try and reclaim something that actually, as you said, who owns the bakery, mm -hmm. right? As Jefferson said, it's not about breadcrumbs, it's about who owns the bakery and who's fighting for the breadcrumbs, right? And there, one of my colleagues and friends, Joanne Barker, has a blog called Tequila Sovereign, where she wrote several pieces immediately after Occupy Wall Street hit. She's based on um, Chitano Ohlone territory in what's known as Oakland, and really tried to push for Oakland to rename itself to decolonize Oakland, and wrote several blogs about this process and also what it meant for people, and I don't mean just whites, but non-indigenous peoples who felt put upon that they were being challenged in terms of the name. You know, asking, well, what do they really want? And what do I have to do now? And she herself is Lenape, and she actually talks about the roots of Wall Street. Wall Street, as some of you know, there actually used to be a wall on that street, and that was built by the Dutch to keep out not just the English settlers, but the Lenape people from their own lands. The first treaty that George Washington brokered was with the Lenape people, promising freedom of mobility in their homeland. We know that that didn't happen. They're forcibly removed by the federal government subsequently to many different spots, many different geographical sites. And so her point was, how can you talk about 21st century corporate malfeasance without understanding the roots of colonial capitalism in the Dutch East India Corporation, right? And we know that it's not just about indigenous peoples from Turtle Island, but you also have the making of the corporation through slave labor. You know down by Wall Street, those are African burials down there. Right, so that's where it comes together, right? That's Cheryl Harris talking about the whiteness of property and that the root, the, the origins of property in this country are rooted in racial domination between stolen land of indigenous peoples and stolen labor of African bodies. And so to me, there's no real discussion that's gonna aggregate to the root of the issue 
of economic and ecological devastation, let alone transformation, without getting to the root, which is not just colonialism, but settler colonialism. And so I want to just put that on the table. I also want to acknowledge that Tiokasen is a guest on my show. I'm going to guest on his show talking about Hawaiian sovereignty and land rights and nationalism. But Tiokasen and Joanne Parker and several other indigenous activists and scholars were on the show to actually talk about Occupy Wall Street. I interviewed five different people to actually try and get at the layers of what the critique entailed and how it was misheard or misunderstood or understood in very superficial uh, terms in, in terms of, you know, like I said, nomenclature label. Um, in terms of mobilizing for economic and ecological transformation, we know that these are really high stakes, and we also know that this has more to do than the devastation of indigeneity. Just like we know the corporate malfeasance did affect the 99%, right? But again, without getting to a root analysis, there's going to be something lacking because it also means that people are abdicating their kuleana or their responsibility to actually deal with the question of indigenous peoples and whose land we're on. And it does stem from the land. The settler colonialism is always about land expropriation. That is its centerpiece. So we have 21st century governments attempting to remove indigenous peoples from their land for corporate resource extraction ranging from oil to minerals to water. And in relation to this contemporary devastation, this has genocidal implications for indigenous peoples throughout the world. I'm just going to use a couple examples from the Americas or Abiyala, North and South America. Um, and part of this I want to acknowledge, of course, the genocidal implications. This is a human ca catastrophe, and it goes beyond indigenous peoples. But I want to cite these indigenous folks because these are people literally on the front lines trying to stab off what, is what governments are backing corporations to come after them, right? We talk about it as a, as a private-public split. But it, we have to remember, it's the state backing corporate interests, right? And so that's what's happening all over the place. One that these are all just very recent cases that made the news just in the last couple of weeks. Canada is now moving to help Peru streamline its environmental assessment for mining projects, i.e., we'll show you how we subordinate our natives so you can put down the native rebellions there that are trying to stop oil extraction. You have indigenous Nicaraguans fighting to the death for their last forest their ancestral territory in the Bosawas, biosphere reserve now targeted for logging. You've got the Hua Orani in the Amazon rainforest in Ecuador, uh, trying to protect their ancestral lands in the area now known as Usani National Park and Biosphere Reserve. It's world renowned for carbon-rich forests and extraordinary biological diversity and is home to many endangered epidemics, and yet it's threatened by encro encroaching oil development, settlers, and illegal loggers. You've got the Brazilian president set to turn the Amazon into an industrial heartland to fuel the state's economy while over 240 tribes protest. Also in Brazil, you've got representatives of the local indigenous communities and environmental activists demonstrating in Sao Paulo against the construction of the Belo Monte Dam, the Zinju River in the Brazilian state of Par. In Alaska, news just hit last week that um, this might be the ground zero for the next big environmental fight, as one journalist put it. And that's Alaska's Bristol Bay Mine Project. This is a dispute over a proposed copper and gold mine near Alaska's Bristol Bay. It's a remote area that is home to several Alaska Native tribes and nearly half of the world's sockeye salmon. Six tribes have asked the Environmental Protection Agency to invoke its powers under the Clean Water Act to, mine them, to block the mine on grounds that it would harm the region's waterways, fish, and wildlife. And I just want to pause there for a minute. That's a sovereignty paradox right there, that a tribe has to rely on a federal agency to try and evoke another federal act to try and stab off, right? It's the same government that's devastated the tribes that it has to appeal to, right? That's a structural problem. That's a, that's a paradox of indigenous sovereignty as it's been subordinated and continues to be subordinated by the federal government. And um, just two more examples. You've got the nation's biggest uranium mine planned now to start again in New Mexico. Two foreign-owned mining companies plan to sink a pair of shafts into the land near Mount Taylor. If approved by the U.S. Forest Service and state agencies, the mine would extract as much as 20 million pounds of the radioactive heavy metal and desecrate as many as 70 acres of land sacred to the tribes there that's been designated by the federal government as traditional cultural property already. Right? And that's where federal, federal plenary power always trumps in the name of national security. And we know that they'll talk about anything having to do with the economy and resource extraction as a security issue, right? 
we can construe anything as a national security issue. We know that because that affects non-Indigenous people in the 99%, right? So again, getting to the root of the issue. There's also an unabated military expansion going on right now in Hawaii and Guam and the Northern Mariana Islands. Uh, especially with the Guam and Northern Mariana Islands, with the U.S. and Japan brokering a deal to remove the military from Okinawa, and they're looking to expand in Guam and dredging and dredging, and that is, is affecting the removal of the Chamorro people, also known as Chamorros, uh, who are migrating to places like Oklahoma or Texas to try and find affordable ways of living. And the same thing happens in Hawaii with um, the striker brigade that's there and ongoing military testing in Makua Valley now throughout the archipelago. And it's also the hot spot for all nuclear subs. It's also head of Pacific Command, as many of you know. I could obviously go on and on. We've got people here at the front lines fighting Keystone and Cell Pipeline. But I'm not going to get into that because that's if, if people on the left know about one kind of issue, they know about Keystone XL. But again, the indigenous piece in that is usually what drops out whose traditional territories that pipeline would go through. We also know that there's more than one pipeline. And again, what does that mean for the water aquifers? What does it mean for people who are on what's, what's, what has been left of their land for them to actually subsist on and not actually have fresh drinking water? That is genocidal, right? That's not being hyperbolic. That is genocidal. People cannot be on their land and they're forced to actually remove for their own survival. And so this gets to these issues of free prior and informed consent that John's going to talk about. As many of you know, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which you know people are trying to mobilize and use as customary law because it's not a convention, it's a declaration. But if you put it into practice, it can become you know understood and used as customary law. You know, has the provision that says tribes have, you know, not tribes, indigenous peoples, which is used interchangeably with nations, tribal nations, indigenous um, tribes. You know, that tribes have the right, or nations and indigenous people must, that, that outsiders must gain prior informed free consent. And what you have right now, and we see with the World Conference on Indigenous Peoples coming down the line next year, which, you know, Kent knows an awful lot about this, has been part of this for years. You have the states co opting what's left of what made it into the Declaration after the decades of drafting process to try and actually remove that phrase of free prior informed consent, consent to consultation and to try and contain and co-op and again domesticate all those issues so that the states have, can just deal with it, right? And again, that's the whole point, is that the indigenous peoples are fighting them in their respective states that encompass them, which is to just to go global and to try and actually set the bar for some kind of you know, bottom line standard in terms of the right to self-determination. So I just want to get at two more things and then I'll, I'll uh, pass, the, pass the baton. I mentioned Occupy Wall Street and the term of occupying where I think the movement fell short in some cases. That's not to say that I want to acknowledge those that did change their name, but again, it's not just the name change. The, the name is loaded and has epistemological, political weight, um, but the, the critique is often still left out, right? And so what happened in those, uh, in the aftermath for those, you know, do they take on that critique in terms of their actual practices? of trying to call into question corporate malfeasance and the devastation in terms of you know, the housing crisis. And we could go on and on about that. But related to that is something that you know just proliferates and proliferates and proliferates on the left, is uh, radicals, progressives, liberals, you know, in that whole spectrum, talking about reclaiming the commons. But again, without actually acknowledging that when you're living in a settler colonial society, that, does, that the commons needs to be complicated because there's nothing common about stolen, um, stolen land, for example. So you have you know, Naomi Klein's really riveting essay from the early 90s where she cites indigenous people and land as one of the many struggles, but actually folds it into a larger discourse of reclaiming the commons, which we know on the left is common sense, right? This is seen as a metaphor for connectivity and something that all of humanity owns these different things and that we've got to stop it and from neoliberal market forces and try and save what's left of the commons from privatization. And yet, when, in those examples I just delineated throughout Yabiala, right, where there's this land ex extort, there's this extraction of resources and land expropriation, and I, I mean, I said extortion, I think it's a Freudian slip, but I actually think you have, right? You're dealing with a lot of corruption in terms of those things. <laughs> but that to reclaim the commons 
in the Commons is something the British brought with them. It is a property concept that they imported, say, in, in North America, for example, to actually talk about when they did corporate characters all throughout New England. The Commons, for them, those are stolen native lands that they created for their own townships. So, I mean, I think we really need to complicate this notion of retaining the Commons. I know that people don't intend it necessarily for it to be about the theft of native lands. You have the work, you know, Donahue talking about suburban, you know, gardeners, and you have people trying to, you know, evoke the diggers and thinking about the radical sort of uh, leveling in terms of economic inequality and talk about, you know, food sovereignty and such. But again, without getting to the root issue of self colonial society and the logic of elimination of the native, as that's Patrick Wolf's kind of phrase, it's always going to fall short. And so um, I guess the question there then becomes this issue of what might our struggles look like if everyday people were um, involved in these, in these kinds of projects that got to the root of the issue. If the dispossession of indigenous peoples that enabled something like the nightmare that is Wall Street in all its manifestations today, what would that actually look like? And that gets me to my last main point, which is about the ethics of radical relationality and to think about our ethical code on our ethical responsibility to engage with indigenous people whose land we're on, whether they're actually present as a collective governing entity or not. So for example, Wangkong, uh, the Wangkong territory where I reside, it's the traditional name as I understand it is Manabeset, and it's also known as Middle <coughs> Right? It took me a very long time to find out that I was on Wangkong land. When I first moved there from Santa Cruz, I moved in the summer and they were going to have their 350th year anniversary parade for the, the founding of the, the city of Middletown. And I called city council and asked if the native people of the land would be partaking in this commemoration and who they are and what their name is. Well, they not only didn't know the answer to my question, they didn't understand the question. And I had to repeat it several times, and then I was seen as, you know, like a shit stirrer, basically. Like, what are, you, what are you on about? What do you want? And I said, well, are the Native people? And she said, yes, there are people here who have been here for generations. <laughs> you know, and she named the number of generations. And she's talking about white settler descendants who trace their genealogy to the earliest colonials, right? So I said, no, no, no. And I tried to explain, because I wanted her to then understand the question. I knew I wasn't going to get the answer. And she literally was like, ma'am, I have to get my supervisor. You know, she put, you know, she put her secret Ma'am, look, is there a problem here? Well, yes, there's a really big problem here. Let me tell you what the problem is. Right? There's this erasure. So then I was told, you know, it took me a long time, and then, then I called the Connecticut Historical Society. They told me to call Foxwoods Casino. <laughs> they didn't even tell me to call the Mash and Tuck at Pequot Museum and Research Center, right? Because the Foxwoods is owned by them. It was called Foxwoods. Yes, I'm going to call the casino. <laughs> so, you know, you get this kind of stuff, but again, the erasure. And then I learned about it from a scholar named um, Paul Grant Costa, who's been researching indigenous peoples in that region and doing that work. And then come years later, I hear about a lecture in the basement of a church on the Wayne Cup and the first church on Main Street in Middletown. And in the audience is a Wayne Cup descendant who basically had introduced himself to the, to the white gentleman giving the lecture to members of the church as a community event. I don't belong to this church. I just heard about it and went to listen. And the, the speaker ceded more than half his time to the Wayne Cup descendant. Turns out he's from one of the surviving families that literally survived King Philip's War in the 1600s, and they're, you know, they're invisible in terms of African ancestry and survivance that way. And he knows all the surviving people in the region. They're in the whole southern New England region because they all know what few survivors there were and who their descendants are. And this man is raised by his great-grandmother, who was raised with her parents, and so who have this unbroken chain through that line. And yet this is someone who's told, you know, on the daily that the people aren't there anymore and don't exist, right? Mm -hmm. Turns out he's a Wesleyan alum, and you know, it, it's right there. He literally works like three streets away from where I reside. So you just, you know, it's part of understanding that but even if you can't find that descendant and go on that, it, part of the issue is unless you live, many of us, many of you, unless you grew up or live or reside in a state like Washington or tribes are visible or Arizona or New Mexico, you're not necessarily going to know whose land you're on. 
And if you're in removal states, and most of the states in the U.S. are removal states that have been ethnically cleansed, and where there's forced removal of tribes, right? It wasn't just the Cherokee on the Trail of Tears to Oklahoma. It's over you know, 35 tribes being removed to this that place, and then other indigenous peoples removed to other places, right? But to, to try and get at what happened there, we can't understand this nightmare that we're living in with U.S. empire without understanding that that's the base, that's the core, that's the root. And part of that quest of understanding what happens, say, if you are a New Yorker, um, what does it mean to then start to embark on learning about the history of Lenape? What would it have meant, what could it look like for people that occupy Wall Street to even just, just engage in a dialogue by actually making contact with the actual the Nazi tribal nations that are organized as governments to even broach a conversation, what could that even look like? I'm not necessarily saying that the Lenape people were waiting for it or would be, you know, in with Occupy Wall Street, but the whole idea of what does it mean in terms of that acknowledgement? And that acknowledgement, I mean that in the root term, right? To actually gain the knowledge, to actually recognize, to be cognizant of something. And that is part of it, is learning about those layers of Settler colonialism and the, the genocidal logic of elimination to get again at the root and to understand that history, I think, is what is absolutely a fundamental or the precondition to actually talking about ecological and economic transformation. I think in order for us to mobilize, we have to actually know what all has happened because, again, those, those cases that I cited, it's indigenous peoples on the front line who are living on those territories. Right, I've, interviewed, I've interviewed people in the Dakotas who are literally living on the land where all the power lines are that are giving electricity to all the surrounding states and they're living in motorhome trailers without electricity. What does it mean that they're living in the heart of where all the electricity is being exported to everyone else? Right, so this is all contemporary, right? And that's the other thing about settler colonialism. If, you know, even if people just talk about colonialism, the franchise kind, it's, you know, it's again relegated to the past in terms of how people talk about it, and I think we just have to absolutely reject that. That is again part of that oration. So I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you so much, Mahal. Thank you. 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 And that is Moa from Ganawake, who's doing a radio program in Buffalo, New York, on the WWKB on the AM radio station. And John has to pay for his time on the air. So, you know, this is very unique that how much he's devoted and, you know, dedicated and, you know, com you know committed to being and bringing out the news in that area in Buffalo, especially the Seneca and the Colorado Reservation in that area operating on that frequency and he has a website that is, is uh, explosive I would say all the time. It's, it's really making me think every time I read it. It's called Let's Talk Native Pride.flockspot.com so you might want to check him out and uh, he's here now and he wants to talk to us and I, I invited him down because he has a direct direct connection with the indigenous people here in the Six Nations in this area up in New York. So this is uh, John Kay and a good, good friend of mine. Thanks. I'm uh, that means I'm uh, uh, of the people from the land of Quint, we're known as Mohawks. Uh, I live in the territory of the Mutawaka, uh, which is the uh, Haudenosaunee people who live in uh, the area of the mountains of western New York, uh, you know, the Seneca. Uh, my wife is uh, Onyota, and you may know that uh, those people as Oneida. Um, I am very, very uh, tied to the people of the Haudenosaunee, not only because I am Haudenosaunee, which uh, again is the, is the word that uh, means the people who uh, uh, belong to us. And I'm very, I'm, I'm very connected to all of the territory of the, of the Six Nations of the Haudenosaunee. Um, I've had the pleasure uh, and the honor of a guest hosting for Jokerson uh, on uh, First Voice of the Indigenous Radio. When, when Jokerson uh, travels or when he, uh, when he decides to go home, uh, as he says, to go home and charge his batteries a little bit. Uh, I've had the privilege of uh, guest hosting his show. And on one of those occasions, um, last, last summer, 
I was uh, packing up for my hotel room, getting ready to leave, and I got a uh, couple of emails that suggested that I go down to the UN because it was August 12th and it was uh, a World Indigenous People's Day. And, and I said, you know, I'm, I'm not really a big fan. I, uh, and I'll get into a little bit about my uh, concerns about the, uh, uh, the UN and their, their best efforts uh, in dealing with Native issues. But uh, I, was, I was further encouraged because the, the program topic was Indigenous Voices in the Media. And I said, well, that's kind of interesting. Um, maybe I will go. Because the first thing that struck me is I was one of the two hosts in the entire state of New York that have a radio show. Um, and I happened to be guest hosting the other one. And huh. nobody thought to, well, maybe we should. We're in New York City. Perhaps we should reach out to the native person who's on the radio in New York City. And, uh, so that, that wasn't to be. So I went. And that's where I had the pleasure of uh, meeting uh, Professor Kalanui. Uh, she was on the panel, uh, in fact, and uh, uh, did, a, did a wonderful job there, just as she did here. Um, eventually, they, they opened up the, uh, the floor to, uh, to the folks sitting, uh, you know, sitting in the assembly, basically General Assembly. And I was sitting right up front. <clears throat> and uh, I was chosen first. And I probably talked much longer than uh, the moderator wanted me to. As a matter of fact, uh, they didn't bring out the book, but they, I think they thought about it. Um, and, I, and I raised those very good issues. The first issue about you know why you, why you wouldn't reach out to somebody, in, uh, a native person on, on the radio, to talk about indigenous media. But I also raised the issue that if the UN really wanted to play a role in trying to encourage native voices in the media. They, they should probably try to uh, uh, do some sort of endorsement, some solicitation, try to get na uh, uh, public radio producers, public radio stations, underwriters, to uh, draw attention to it. Here, here the UN was taking a day out of its busy day. Ban Ki-moon was there. Uh, the the undersecretary for uh, economic development was there. And yet nobody addressed the, uh, the uh, you know, to me, which, which was the obvious. Perhaps it's time to put a little bit of pressure on, uh, on the folks in public radio, because Carving out an hour of public radio is the easiest way to afford a, a, a native uh, produced show to, uh, to get on the air. Because buying a station is expensive. I am not afforded an hour. I, I bought, buy my time. I'm on uh, commercial radio. I'm on WWKB. It's a, one of those legendary rock and roll stations from the 50s back when AM was king of music. And, uh, um, they are considered the, uh, the, the left uh, Entercom Communications, which owns the company, uh, owns five stations, it, which is the way the radio business is done now. You have one, uh, one company that owns five, six, seven, eight stations in a given market, and uh, uh, so they have the flagship station, and then they have their redhead stepchild. Well, WWKB is the redhead stepchild, uh, and, but the reason for me to be on that program is it happens to bang out with a 50,000 watt signal, uh, a, a very powerful signal, especially in the evening, especially in the wintertime. Um, my show can actually be picked up on AM radio as far as uh, Hartford, Connecticut. Uh, I've had uh, Jay Nightwolf, who does a show down in, uh, in DC. Every once in a while, he'll run his car, sit in, the, sit in his car, turn on the AM radio, and see if he can pick me up on, on a Sunday night. Um, I, I started off buying an hour. And I, frankly, I don't know how you guys do it. <laughs> when Joe just does a show for an hour, and I guess those for him, I just feel like there's not enough time to get a very good point across. Um, and and Tilgan does an effective job, and, 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 as, as a brother covered it. Yeah, but it's, it's tough, especially if you want to uh, really try to engage uh, in, and get into a deeper, deeper conversation. It is really hard to do it in, uh, in, in a one hour format. So, uh, when I garnered enough support to purchase another hour, I went to two hours. So, I'm on from, uh, from Sunday nights from 9 11. I have business cards, I'll distribute to each one, any of you can have one, so you don't need to write all this stuff down. I do write a blog, as Fields and uh, mentioned. Um, I've been doing that for a long time. I've been doing that since uh, 2007, 2008. Um, I've been on radio uh, doing my own show, Let's Talk Native with John King, for, uh, I'm almost finished my third year right now. And why do I mean, why, why do radio? And, and this is, this is kind, of the, you know, kind of the key to what, what the jokes and the panel was, that was really here to discuss. The reason to do radio is because we have to get some of these uh, some of this information out there, and and we've got to do it compellingly. We've got to do it in a way um, that we engage an audience. And 
it's not enough to do a blog. It's not enough to do internet radio. It's not enough to do a YouTube video or once in a while. If you don't have some place on the dial when somebody's in a car and when somebody's you know, at, at home or whatever, you almost need a foundation. Radio is that perfect foundation. And whether it's commercial radio that, you're pro that paid programming like mine, or whether it's a university uh, a supported station or, or a public radio or semi slash public radio, I mean, there's, there's all kinds of animals out there. Um, the reality is, uh, to the extent that Joe was mentioned uh, native owned stations, uh, many of the native owned stations don't even have much native programming. Most of them, uh, they, they get into this as a venture. They get in, into this as a commercial venture. So what happens is the, the native, and, and I can say this because the Seneca Nation owns the, owns the radio station in Western New York. I'm not on it. Um, they're trying to make a commercial success of this thing. Um, and it's pretty much failing miserably. So they don't treat it as a community service. They don't treat it as, as a means for them to control their own messages out there. They, they just play, you know, Good, easy listening rock and roll, you know, kind of the milk toast stuff that you find on a lot of these internet radio stations. So that's what they do there. I think that's going to change because I think, I think they're seeing the fall of their ways. Um, but that goes to, that you can go, go throughout any country. You can go out through all native territories and you're going to find many radio, native radio stations that maybe carve out a program here or there. But by and large, most of the programming on these, on these stations are not really geared. Towards, uh, towards servicing their own community or doing an outreach to the non-native community. I'm in Buffalo, um, again, in the territory of the Seneca Nation, Western New York, um, powerful signal. I know that uh, by and large, most of the people who are listening, are listening to my show are, are non-native. Most of my callers, I, I, it is a live show, it's a call-in show. Most of my callers are non-native. I do know that I have a strong uh, native uh, listenership. Again, uh, Hand out cards. You can go to my blog. I also have a page on uh, on KB's website. All of my shows are archived. You can listen to them. Uh, I will admit, on the KB page, only for the last year have I really been putting much in the description. So the dates are just dates. But uh, on my blog, I pretty much have always had a, uh, a description on the, on the shows. Uh, and I've done shows that range from from everything, from our conflicts with New York State, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that because we're here and. Bastions of power in New York State are down in this neck of the woods, so I, I got to take my shots at uh, Andrew Cuomo and, and others. So I'll, I'll do that on here. Um, so, I, but I, and I do that. I take I take the opportunity to talk about the battles that we have with New York State. I also take the opportunity to talk about the battles we have with uh, with Washington. You know, we we are now living in a time where there's a, a, a Democrat in the White House and the, the Democrat in the governor's mansion. And we have some of the worst relationships with, uh, with New York State and the federal government we've ever had. And I know the Crow gave uh, um, Obama an Indian name. And there are people in the Indian country that would suggest that he's the greatest president that the Native people have ever seen. Well, first off, I guess to, to clear a couple of things up, he's not my president. And Andrew Cuomo's not my governor. I'm Vinja Gahaga. I'm not an American. I don't condemn those who are Americans. I don't condemn those who want to be Americans. I don't condemn native people who want to be Americans. But the presumption that that uh, that because I'm walking in on the same streets that I'm, I'm American and that I should somehow have some sort of patriotic duty, I'm one of those guys who don't understand why so many native people enlist in the armed services. You know, frankly, uh, other than it just being a continuation of a mentality that uh, was born out of residential schools. But uh, so I, I have some issues with that. On my show, I don't talk about what everybody else talks about. I, I really try to take the mystery out of what being a native is. I don't talk a whole lot about native spirituality. I don't try to interpret our creation story for uh, neither for the, for the native people listening or for the non-native people. I have an opinion on that, and uh, I, I have an opinion on a lot of things, and, I, and I'll share those. But that's not what I, why I do radio. And in fact, if I do venture to talk about creation story, I'm going to talk about the pragmatic effect of it and why. Why there's a moral to the story. I'm not going to preach about it as if it was Genesis from the Bible. I'm also not a fan of Indian treaties because they aren't. We didn't write them, we didn't ask for them, although we paid dearly for them. The, those are a matter of US, uh, US law. Even though a good no a number of them were, were improperly ratified or not ratified at all on either side. Most of them are, uh, are just a function of uh, fraud. 
and stealing land. Most of them uh, have, have been broken in any number of ways. And, and I'll tell you, uh, again, Bonin uh, one of the, the, the treaties that always gets brought up is the 1794 Treaty of Canandaigua. Oh, it's, how it's the seminal treaty of, uh, of all treaties. Well, I'm sorry, that's bullshit. There are seven articles in that treaty. Three of them say the same thing, that the United States acknowledges that our land is ours and they will never claim the same. Never means never to me, but apparently it doesn't mean never to the United States. We're locked in the throes every single day, battling with New York State, trying to assert their, their jurisdiction, their sovereignty, their regulations, their, their, their laws on our people. So how, is, how the hell can New York State do that if the United States itself claims they will never claim our land? Well, we still maintain that, that, that our land is our land, in, uh, in, spite of what the, uh, uh, in spite of how they try to adjudicate it away, in spite of how they try to legislate it away, it, uh, we are, we're still there. These, the, these treaties, oftentimes people try to hang a singular thing on the thing that say, oh yeah, this is proof this, look this. Every year there's a woman who sits down in Washington who's among her many duties is to uh, requisition $4,500 worth of cloth. Because in the Canandaigua Treaty, there's uh, a payment that was supposed to go on forever. And this payment was a payment in, in livestock, in farm equipment, in, uh, in tools, in, uh, and in cloth. In 1794, that was $4,500. Today, it's still $4,500. Uh -huh. And for 100,000 hood in a story, that breaks down to four and a half cents worth of cloth each year. And yet, there are Native people who will treat that stuff like the shroud of curry. I'm sorry. Uh, there's not enough cloth in four and a half cents worth to, to do anything with, let alone white grass. So I'm not going to honor treaty cloth. I have some serious problems with anybody who would sit there and, and march up to a podium with a table there, lay out some cloth that they just got from the Bureau of Indian Affairs and say, look, there's the United States honoring its, uh, its end of the deal. <laughs> I'm sorry. To me, it's, it's, it, it is as bold an insult as, uh, uh, as, they, could, as they could make. So unlike <laughs> my friend here, I do talk a lot about my, on my show, and I express opinion. My, my show is, is a news and news. Now, again, why do it? Because it matters. Because it makes a difference. And I'll tell you, I'll, I'll give you a few examples. Some of them may not be the most uh, life-changing for, for all people, but uh, we had an incident a couple of years ago we're in New York, uh, uh, in, in Seneca Territory, they have a thing called the, uh, a, a foundation uh, called the uh, Seneca Diabetes Foundation. And once a year, they do their gala event to raise money. And, um, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a black tie affair. Uh, I don't go too often. Um, they hosted, uh, on occasion, and, and on this occasion, they hosted the Seneca Niagara Casino, which is the, the casino in Niagara Falls that's owned by the Seneca Nation. So after all the doings, and there's a lot of uh, non-native politicians and, you know, uh, uh, Civic leaders and that kind of stuff that go to these events. So, uh, and, and it's it's in a casino. It is an alcoholic event. I mean, there there's a bar and that kind of stuff. So at the end of the day, or after the uh, after the event, uh, down in the main lobby of the Seneca Niagara Casino, two Seneca gentlemen who were having a lively discussion. Uh, no, they were having an argument. They were calling each other down uh, about um, uh, and they're competing in, in the tobacco business with each other, which is another issue. Um, and they were having this view. And some little guy um, who happens to be a New York State Senator by the name of Mark Rosanti decided that he was going to uh, uh, assert, insert himself into the discussion and say, oh, come on, you guys, why don't you just settle down? It's been a nice event. You don't need to be acting like that. Now, mind you, this is a Seneca event. These are Seneca gentlemen having a, uh, uh, this conversation. Um, and it's a Seneca venue. And as this guy comes, uh, comes approaches this, this event, uh, this disturbance, it, it's already been broken up. But he decided that he wanted to insert himself into the whole thing. It didn't go well. Uh, to make a long story short, uh, Mark Rosanti uh, uh, was rolling around on the casino floor. His <laughs> wife came out, uh, uh, threw a drink in, up in uh, a Seneca woman's face, which I would never advise anybody to throw a drink in a Seneca woman's face. Uh, uh, and actually raped her across the face with a fingernail. And so Mark Rosani's wife got the crap pounded out of her as well. Uh, and of course, it all got broken up. 
immediate headlines, and I don't, I'm not talking about Western New York, New York Times, Washington Post, all over in Europe, they were reporting how a New York State senator was, a, was savagely attacked by Indians at the casino. That's, that was the headline. That was the immediate headline. I had folks that were on the day, were there, come on my show, uh, had somebody with cell phone video, used the video. Um, within a day after my show, the headlines had turned around. So it was no longer New York State Senator attacked by Indians. You know, and th there was no more uh, fire water comments, there were no more savage beatings, there was no more uh, uh, the, all the, all the, the, the negative, negative uh, epithets they're going to put on there to describe what, what Mark Rosanti claimed to have to do. Um, as a result of that, me telling them the other story, the real story, um, of course the big question is, wow, when are you going to see the video? So the casinos have surveillance guys, you're never going to see the video. It's not my fault, but you're never going to see the video. That's not the nature of uh, doing surveillance in a casino, it's not to, you know, to, to drag somebody down. And, the, the, the police will look at it if it was a, a warrant and a charge, and somebody would be charged. And of course, everything that I said turned out to be true. Everything Mark Rosanti, the senior senator, senator said, and his wife said, and any press conference, at the press conference, at the press conference, even his handlers were telling him, Mark, will you please shut the bleep up? You're not helping yourself any. Um, so, uh, my show, small show on AM radio in Western New York, changed that message. Now, as a result of doing that, um, it also thrust the idea of, of a native uh, uh, talk show host into other media sources. Channel 2, I've been on, I've been on uh, Channel 2 does a uh, talk show on uh, midday, right? as the NBC affiliate in, uh, in, in Buffalo. I've been on uh, Two Sides for Christy Reserve a dozen times now. Um, uh, Susan Arbetter, who does a uh, show called Capital Press Room up in, uh, in the Albany area, and it's on 20 other markets, but on her, her show a dozen times. Uh, WBFO, which is the, uh, the, the public radio station in, in Western New York, I've been on, on that program. I not, now all of a sudden, because I proved that, that I could be credible as a native radio talk show host, now they have somebody they can go to that's not going to give one, one word answers. I don't mean to uh, discourage native people when they get in front of the camera or get to a microphone, but too often our guys uh, give one word answers. And that's, that does not make for good radio, it does not make for good television. And so uh, that's often, oftentimes why you, you don't see it. Now, and not to mention the fact that a lot of people uh, will, will be gun shy. Um, I'm not one of those people. I am willing to, to talk about the issues and talk about the issues in a way that I think are engaging. I think it's important that people understand that the way the media portrays native issues or their failures to address native issues is, uh, is something that's got to change. You know, it's, it's one of the things that I brought up again at, at, at that UN conference or the UN uh, uh, event last, last summer. You know, the other thing I brought up at the UN was uh, what I consider uh, to be among the huge failings that the UN Declaration of the Rights of the Indigenous People represents. Uh, one of the questions that I put to the panel, including uh, my guests that are up right here, was um, where's the rubber beat the road on this? Now, how do you, how do we end up, if not giving it force, but give it, give it some meaning? Because frankly, the, the, the declaration itself, uh, as was indicated, falls pretty short on a lot of issues. It still really almost entrenches that relationship of the dominator versus the dominated. I mean, it is really, if you read it, it, all, it almost says it that way. I mean, it, uh, uh, it, it, it enforces the idea that you have an indigenous people who are, inter uh, who are entitled to some rights by their, by their, their suppressors. I'm sorry, that's the, way, that's the way it reads. But it does do a couple of things. The third affirmation of the, uh, uh, of the UN group uh, is as close to a UN attack on the doctrine of Christian discovery that exists anywhere. It really just calls it, it without naming it, because they're not quite that bold yet. Um, although the World Indigenous Peoples Forum may finally get to that point next year, we'll see. Um, the doctrine of Christian discovery is, uh, is uh, I, I, again, as the was mentioned, it, it is born out of people wolves from the, from the 15th century. It is essentially not about converting native people into Christianity. It's not about saving souls. It was about expanding Christendom. It was about, and, and by Christendom, it means creating a dominant society uh, and dominating the land, the people, and the resources. Everything that we 
talk about here. I mean, this whole conference which, uh, that is talking about the ecological issues. It's about, uh, and, and, and then, again, uh, as Professor Carnu has been discussing, it's all about uh, exploiting the, the land and oftentimes either removing the native people that are there or, um, and it is an act of genocide. Assimilation is an act of genocide. Or converting them to something that they, they never were. Trying to turn them into American citizens. Trying to turn them into, uh, uh, into New Yorkers or, or Canadians or Albertans or, or whatever. That's what, the, and that's born out of the doctrine of Christian discovery. I mean, and, and, and it is clear, it, it is clear. I've, I've had Stephen Newcomb, who is really the, the, the foremost authority on the subject. He's been on my show twice. I got four hours of Stephen Newcomb. You can look it up, it's on my, it's on my web page. Uh, I actually brought Stephen Newcomb uh, uh, on when I guest hosted for uh, the this uh, uh, last, last month or the month before. Uh, and his work, uh, his book, which is Pagans uh, in the Promised Land, uh, decoding the doctrine of Christian discovery, is the most important work on the subject done anywhere. <coughs> Uh, he's brought that issue to the UN on several occasions, but if you ask Stephen Newcomb what his view about the UN doing anything with it, he's not up on this thing. And, and nor, nor <coughs> I. But I still will go down to the UN. If it's a forum to, uh, you know, to, to address issues, then I'm going to take that opportunity. And just like I'm paying every week to be on, uh, to be on a commercial radio station, it's important. It's important work that we do. It's important work that we get it out there. It's important that we stand up and we fight for these issues. I'm rocking my I don't know more t-shirt. Um, the problem I have with I don't know more is frankly it was a little too passive. Um, and I know Deborah agrees with me on that because we've had some conversations on Facebook. Um, they took a very strong uh, position against um, uh, nonviolent direct action. Uh, I'm Mohawk. It's in my uh, genetic makeup to uh, to. Well, sometimes nonviolent direct action, but sometimes if you, you got to do what you got to do. Um, so the idea of just doing uh, um, nice round dances on, uh, to address something, it's nice to draw, draw attention to it. The last nice round dance I went to, I got into a, uh, into a scuffle with a Chihuahua police officer because he was trying to shut it down. To me, that's, that's my kind of demonstration. <laughs> so, uh, it's on YouTube, by the way. Uh, <laughs> you can look up Chihuahua, please. Anyway, uh, I have that. Uh, and I also have a video from, from uh, going to the UN, uh, and that's on my, uh, uh, my uh, blog, uh, uh, my video. The video's on my blog as well. But you have to resist, and there are ways to resist. The one thing about standing up and, and, uh, and really actually getting physical without getting myself arrested with, uh, with, with a policeman and I became the center of the attention, and I didn't go there for that. I was going to round dance like everybody else, but I saw a mall cop like losing his mind, and, and I asked him, "We got a problem because you're fucking right with a problem." He said, "I got the chief of police, the Williams of the police, the Clarence police coming here right now. And you're going to arrest all your asses." Really? I couldn't even like smile at this guy. I did lots of smiling with the chief of police officer. As he grabbed me and I rocked and I, and I walked him back three or four steps, and I said. Uh, and I, and I, again, smiled broadly and I said, do you really want to do this? Just look at this. There's, there's like hundreds of people here. There was, there was maybe five or six hundred people. Not the 5,000 you would see in, at the Edmonton Mall or even the Mall of America. But, uh, um, but I disarmed him. I, I did. I, I, I changed his mind. And, and that's my point. My point is you can't just write letters to congressmen. And you can't just um, Facebook each other. Sometimes you got to do stuff. Sometimes you got to stand up. And the idea of doing radio is not to be, for me, is never to be the last word on any of these subjects. It's to continue the conversation, encourage the conversation, feed the conversation, so the conversation continues. And so that conversation goes beyond the conversation and then turns into action. We do need to stand in the way of uh, the XL pipeline. And it's not just about pipelines that leak. It's about the idea of, of wiping out an area the size of Florida and Alberta, the, the wiping out a boreal forest, and creating right now the, their inability to get that, uh, that, that those tar sands oils to market is the bottleneck that is everything slowing it down right now. I don't think just stopping the, X, the Keystone XL pipeline is enough. There's going to have to be more direct action than that. And it's not just on us, it's on all of you. 
At some point, we all need to stand up. It's nice to have a, an opinion about something. But if people don't stand up and do, stuff, do things about it, then that, that opinion is meaningless. And we, we can't all do everything all of the time. Part of the reason I got into radio is, frankly, I'm not going to get any younger. Um, I've had my knockdown dragons. And I play a couple. I only got about <coughs> half a can of whoop ass left in me. <laughs> and, and I'm saving it. <laughs> so in the meantime, I'll dance with the Tijuana police officer, but I hope I don't have to wrestle. <laughs> but somebody may have to. I've got, when I really got involved in Native issues, I was, um, I was in my 20s. You know, and I really got active. And, and when you're 20, you're, you're bulletproof and invisible. You can do all kinds of things. I'm a grandfather now. I've raised three children. And I, and I raised three children on native territory. And I, I'm going to digress a little bit. I raised three kids. I didn't put one of them through rehab, and I haven't had to bail one of them out of jail. I haven't had to be bailed out of jail a few times along those way. Well, no, uh, but I trust me. When I had to be bailed out of jail, it was because I was fighting for something I believed in. It wasn't because I was, you know, got caught doing something. I have six grandchildren now. When you're young and you're an activist, and, and even when you're, uh, when you're a father, you don't anticipate, at least I did, maybe other people, I, you don't anticipate being a grandparent. And you don't know what that does to you. I also had the, um, the misfortune to, to see my middle, child, my middle daughter lose her husband, uh, fine son of a Seneca young man, uh, to bone cancer a year ago last December. There's reasons people get bone cancer. And the, well, oftentimes those reasons have to, have to do with what's, uh, what's happened to our territories. To that pollution to the ground. Onondaga Lake is the most polluted lake in the country, in the United States. 13 feet of mercury in the bottom of Onondaga Lake. Up, upstream of the Cattaraugus Territory of the Seneca Nation is West Valley Nuclear Storage Facility. And it's funny, they talk about, uh, um, they don't call it, there's another word for it, they don't call it breach, but they, but they talk about when they have a leak, essentially, when, they, when that radioactivity makes it into the Cattaraugus Creek, they, they got a word for it. But, uh, so that's what, that's what we have to do. Of course, I know Steve Oakerson has uh, addressed it on his show, the open uranium mines in the, the Lakota Territory. The coal top, uh, the, the mountain top removal for coal, hydrofracking, not just the pipelines uh, uh, issues, but, but all of them. Um, in in Akwesasne, Akwesasne, which is the Mohawk territory at the top of the, of the state, Akwesasne is a unique place in that um, they decided, somebody decided they were going to put a, a, a line, a pretend there's a line that goes through the river there, and they call one side of the Canada and the other side of the United States. And then on the side that's on the Canadian side, they call one part of uh, Ontario and the other part of Quebec. So in Aquasasi, Mohawk Territory, you've got, uh, you, you've got a native territory, a Gunyagahaga territory, that is divided by two provinces, a state, and two countries. So you have, you have Alcoa and Gian that have basically polluted the area so bad and, and there's, there's several super fun sites up there on the, on the Sacred River, on the Grass River, and a couple of the other rivers up there. Leukemia is a, uh, is, is a bomb. Um, even doing a basic farming, uh, they had a problem where their cattle were dying, their teeth were falling out. Um, this is, and nobody talks about this stuff. <coughs> that's why we have to do radio. That's why what T.O. does is important. That's why what Professor Carbonelli does is important. But the thing is, there needs to be more voices. And, then, and, and for those of us, what we do is we take, we take these shows and we put them on the internet. And sometimes we, we make a YouTube video or we, uh, we, we talk about it on Facebook. This information has to get out and it's relevant and it's important. Because things have to be done. And it matters because it does affect change. Now I'm not saying we're winning the battle, but I will say this. This generation, and, and I'm, I'm not going to say this with a whole lot of caution, this generation is done to advance, advance sovereignty than the seven before us. Yeah, I said it. I just called down my ancestors. I'm sorry, when we talk seven generations, we've got to go farther back than that before we have people who really have their minds right. Corn Flammer, Handsome Lake, 
These guys signed away more land. When I hear people con uh, condemn uh, our young people, the alcoholism that existed in Seneca territory, for instance, and not just Seneca territory, but in the whole ter territory of the Haudenosaunee from 1790s, that Canandaigua Treaty, I told you the good parts. The bad parts is all the land got seated, except for a couple of tiny little spots, which, which got, they got screwed out of uh, subsequently from that. So from 1790, from 1784 to 1848, we still had our language. We still had traditional chiefs. What we didn't have was we didn't have a plan system anymore. What we had was arrogant men, arrogant men in our territory who bought into the male dominant society uh, uh, bullshit that Thomas Jefferson, Alexander Hamilton, and others were pushing on. Women didn't get taken out of our fields because the plow was too heavy for them. Trust me. Yeah. Our women were the plow. <laughs> women got taken out of, our, out of our fields because those men were convinced that you needed to you needed to put women in the home. You needed to take them out of the fields. You couldn't let the women dominate or uh, control the food supply. You couldn't let women be the title holders of that land. Not the owners. Because we don't own the land. We vested the title of our lands on our women because they were holding it for the faces unborn. I'll tell you a story. There was a gentleman, uh, and, and I heard the story once. <coughs> gentleman shows up to an uh, old native guy. Of course, first thing he called him was Chief. Hey, Chief! Uh, you know who owns this land? He said, uh, Yeah, he said, I'd like to buy it. I've got lots of money to spend. He says, uh, um, Yeah, I know who owns this land. And he says, uh, well, where can I find them? Uh, they're not here. Oh, when are they going to be here? He turns and he looks and he sees, uh, he looks back and he sees a couple of young women over there. One of them's a bit of a belly. About three months. <laughs> I'll tell you what, Chief, I'll be back in three months. Three months later, he comes there. And he says, uh, did uh, those people who own that land show up yet? He says, uh, no. Folks who own this land uh, are not here yet. Not here yet. Really? What, what do you think they're going to be here? He's back and he sees a woman there taking care of a little baby. He sees another little girl, only just a little tiny bump. Uh, six months. The guy comes back six months. And this repeated, repeated. What he didn't understand was that that land is for the unborn faces. <clears throat> Once you're born, your job becomes to maintain that that land stays for the unborn faces. We've had some bad history. And although I don't think we're winning the war yet, this generation has done a lot. Folks like some of the ones that are here. And folks that you'll never know their names. Some that are no longer with us. There have been plenty that have stood up and have changed the conversation. People didn't, I mean, sovereignty is our word. We kind of, we took one from you, <laughs> from French anyway. Mm -hmm. our, the closest word we have in Mohawk means uh, uh, to carry yourself. So we talk about sovereignty. We look at it differently than the way Europeans do. And in fact, in 1776, when, when a, when the colonists decided that they needed to somehow break the, the chains that bound them to, to England, they needed to, this wasn't just about an impending war. They had to, had, to, had to build a rationale. They had to explain how it is that the rest of the world could accept that they were gonna break, the, break their ties to their, uh, to their motherland. So where did they come up with such a rationale? Well, they came up with it from us. The idea that sovereignty was, uh, was, a, was, a, was bestowed upon a royal family by God, that was the European law. And yeah, there was some buzz in, in Europe at the time, with Locke, Voltaire, and different people that talked about these kinds of things, and that, uh, that geez, maybe we don't have it quite right. Poor people were starting to say, you know, I don't know that I like this system. <laughs> so where in, where in the world did the system exist where, where sovereignty was a birthright? Here. And I'm not just talking, I, I'm speaking of Pony Nishoni, but I, I know that it wasn't just Pony Nishoni. It was here that 
the, the concept that you were born, um, and not just we as people, but all of creation. The creation, and I'm not going to say the creator, I'm not going to say you know, great spirit, uh, creation provided a path for everything that we see, whether it's the moon across the sky, whether it's the stars across the sky, whether it's the thunders that come through, whether it's the strawberries that grow, whether it's our children, whether it's a rabbit, whether, whatever it is. We, we all, in fact, we, uh, we sometimes refer to it as our original message, our original instructions. You, you'll hear that sometimes if you're around in the country long enough. Again, I try to put it in a way that people understand it. We've all been provided with a path. That path is, 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 uh, is, is natural. And so that path was, is a part of being born, it's a part of being created. It is not something that, and it's individual. We all have the right and the wrong responsibility. The responsibility was the word? Kuliana. Yeah. Uh, we, we have that responsibility to carry ourselves. We also have a responsibility to carry others and to help others mm -hmm. and, and, and to make sure that we give back to the patient and that, that kind of thing. But sovereignty is an individual birthright, uh, in my way. It is not a collective right. It is a right we defend collectively. But it's not the tribe's power. It's not the BIA's recognized leadership that has that power. It is not the chief, it's not the clan mother, it's not the president, it's not the trustee, it's not whatever, a bank, a bank council chief. They are not the ones who, uh, who have been invested or vested with that authority. Every one of the children, all of us are. And we've never divested ourselves that to them, nor have we divested any of that to the state, federal government, the province. The question about treaties, isn't where in the treaty does it say you can sell cigarettes? The question is, where did you, we give you the right to tell us what we do on our territories? The whole, the whole conversation has to be turned around. We don't need to defend our sovereignty in, in their courts of law. And if we get dragged into their courts of law, let them produce the foundation for, uh, for their imposition, for their subjugation. Because I guarantee the only place they can ever get to take it back to is going to be the papal bulls from 1493. Because there is no foundation of law. Because you can't adjudicate our sovereignty away. And you can't legislate it. The international community, they would never say, well, if you pass a law in this country that says this person, in 1924, the U.S. Senate declared all native people born in the United States, when the the of the United States, were U.S. citizens. I didn't ask to be a U.S. citizen. And, they did, and, and, the, and the fact of the matter is, perhaps some did. And, and there, were, there were a few little ways that people could do that, where I had to do a military service before that. But when they passed the law, the hood and the rejected it, as did others. You can't just pass a law and say that somebody has ceased to exist. I mean, you pass, I'll say, I'll take it back. Yes, you can. You can pass a law and say somebody ceased to exist. It doesn't mean it ceased to, cease to exist. We, we still, we're still here. I'm still going to go out. And, and they can't, a judge can't say that we don't exist. We're in the throes of battles with New York State every single day. Andrew Cuomo, we're battling New York State over gaming, gaming revenue, we're battling them over, over them trying to interfere. And, and I'm not going to talk about the gaming stuff as much. And, and to the extent that I want to talk about, uh, mention the tobacco issue, and, and I think it's important to know this, know this. We carved out a private sector business that is also part of, uh, and oftentimes there are native tribes, their irrigation business. And we utilize the fact that uh, New York State can, uh, cannot impose its taxation on us. We've been doing it for, uh, for over 30 years. We've been in the tobacco business for about uh, uh, 10,000 years. Uh, in fact, you can go out to Lakota territory, and there are specific strains of tobacco that are in Lakota territory that specifically came from the Haudenosaunee, from the Lenape, from the Algonquins, and different people. So that's the, the trade that's gone on for, for thousands and thousands of years. So when the uh, when the John Wolf who kidnapped and brainwashed Pocahontas. Uh, uh, co-opted the tobacco business into something that we never intended to be. Um, they built something else. And when we re-entered that, that trade back 30, 40 years ago, New York State didn't know what to do about it. 
because they knew they didn't really have any legal foundation to, to stop them. Uh, but we weren't making cigarettes. We were just buying Philip Morris products, you know, without the tax on it and selling it non native people coming out of our territories. But that's that's not the business that, as it exists today. Now we have major manufacturers on uh, on both the north side of the Van Mary line, uh, uh, Oswego, Grand River in, uh, in Ontario, uh, Grand River Enterprises, man manufacturers of Seneca brand cigarettes, and uh, we have manufacturers in Washington, uh, the uh, uh, Yakima, uh, and, and there's territories all, all around that, that that are manufactured. New York State is suing any of the manufacturers, native manufacturers of native products from, from outside the state, suing them, trying to bar them from being able to bring them from, 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 from their product coming to our territory. Now this is native to native trade. That Andrew Cuomo, Eric Schneiderman, and then the, the, the Department, New York State Department of Taxation and Finance, Commissioner Thomas Maddox, that they are after, that they are fully engaged right now. And native to native trade, even if it's a, 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 a not a very politically correct product like cigarettes, is still something that we need to fight for. I don't fight for casinos, I don't fight for tobacco, but I, I, I do fight for sovereignty. And so we have to defend the, uh, we, we have to stand up. And, and it's important that people know in New York State, in New York City, and across the country, that what, the, the things that we're engaged in with Andrew Cuomo is really an affront to all native territories. And again, he's suing a, a, a manufacturer in, in, Yakima, in, in Yakima territory. So this is the, the, the battle we're still in every day. And I talk about these things, uh, you know, again, that's the value, and that's why I'm glad T. Okeson brought this subject to this forum. Because I don't know that I'm left. I don't know that I'm liberal. I know that I'm native. I know that I'm going to go out. And I'll come back to this forum as long as they'll keep having us. And we'll make as much noise in every forum that they provide to us, including on the radio. Thank you. <laughs>
Right on. That's what we are going through. This, reason, this is the reason why, is because uh, today in the world, we, in the English language in America and other Romance languages, but mainly in the United States, is that 60% of the English language is based in Latin. And their meanings used, are used to dominate and control and commit war, uh, possess, rationalize occupancy of the land of the Western Hemisphere. And this is what we operate under, even the left and the right. And that's why I don't like what John said, because the left to me is just the left arm of the right. There's no difference to native people. But they think it is because it's being altered and native. So it doesn't make a difference to native people, and I agree with that. And I think that because of the, I think it was 597 treaties that were signed or were actually negotiated with the United States, is that they, they cannot be rescinded or, or, how do you say it, reactivated. It's because they, they have this Latin in place. And I had a friend, Jose Cruz, I think it was with the, um, the National Indian Treaty Council in 1992, I met him in Hawaii, and he said that he went down into the, to the, to the lower levels of the Smithsonian, and there he saw most of the trees that were in little files and, and, and you know, in drawers, and he noticed that some of these trees, the native people, of course, inked it, and the name was signed in ink, but the officials of the U.S. government signed theirs in pencil. Mm -hmm. So this was another manipulation besides everything else you saw in that. So this is the why I think the trees will never be brought back is because it's based in Latin. And they can't comprehend indigenous languages. This is why they have to get rid of indigenous languages. And I know from, from elders, like 20% of our language cannot be translated into English because the concepts are too abstract. Or too inclusive. And one word that has gotten to everybody because of the patriarchy and the patriarchal language, hierarchical language, one word is what we don't have. And I, I got this from Virgil Kilstreet um, about two years ago. And uh, it was in research with, with Steve Newcomb, who did uh, Pagans in the Promised Land. And we were in, in Auschwitz, Birkenau, of all places. And we were sitting there, and we were discussing things with a priest of all, a Catholic priest. And he was using the word domination quite a bit. And I asked Virgil, and he knew something. I said, Virgil, is, is there a word for domination or concept of domination? He said, no. So this is why the 1400 that remarkable languages rational, hierarchical, patriarchal languages. They can sell and buy you and make you slaves. And this is, this is why radio has to be done this way. And I think it's the most dangerous thought process because that 1% they occupy is always talking about. Well, we see the 99% because the 1% of its native people, which the population is in the United States, are the 1% that are balancing out that 1% at the other side because of the way we think. The native radio is, is, is what it's an oral tradition I think it's needs and any it's needed here and any of you who have the gumption and want to get into radio and to prove yourself wrong before you say something on the radio, not other people. Prove yourself wrong. Because you need you have an experience as uh, an indigenous person to bring to the air. You don't have a right. I don't, I don't deal with this right. That's their word for us. We have a responsibility. It's more at home when we have a responsibility. And, I, and I've interviewed everybody from Robert Kennedy to Mikhail Gorbachev of all people. And these people I've interviewed. And they're, they're looking towards indigenous peoples. There's not enough to take reference from because they don't know who to go to. They'll go to the one who's playing the drums and the flutes and wearing the feathers and talking noble instead of the, the ones on the ground. So this is uh, what I'd like to say. And I'd like uh, there's a couple more some questions here, and uh, if we can, if we can, if you have one or a panelist here for each of them, and then we have to move out of here and, and continue. So, uh, but that's our presentation for for this afternoon. Thank you.
I'm just wondering about like the you know broadcast radio. Is there like a digital divide in upstate New York or with indigenous people? Because increasingly, like having to be like on like a radio station is becoming you know almost like if you you say like you put it up on the web, why not just make it downloaded then? You know what I'm saying? Like you're saying it's important to have that central hub. I'm just wondering, in the digital age, is it so important to have that central hub? There, there's, there really is a strong uh, need to get it out over the airwaves first. And, and the reason is you get more interactive. I know you can do the, the same thing with the live, uh, internet radio. Um, and I do stream live, and uh, the guard can give you a little bit of information on how to do that. Um, but going over the air, it, it allows you to catch some people even by accident. You, you, you don't listen to, to uh, um, people on the internet by accident. You have to look for them. Oftentimes, uh, what I find is that you can, you'll stumble across people. Or people are, I should say, people will stumble across you. And frankly, we've got to find people in whichever way we can. And we don't have agents. And we don't exactly have PR firms that are promoting us. Uh, so we've got to be, and, and by being on a commercial radio station that's already advertising themselves, even if not our show, and even in some means, you know, whether, whether it's even through WBAI, for instance, uh, uh, helping with some, with some of the events here, it gets, the stations get out there. And, and so at this point, perhaps that's not going to be the, the paradigm always, but it is now. I, I still think it is now. Uh, hi, I'm John Nelson. We came down from Woodstock with the Elks and Eagles and Stephanie Wells. And uh, we're doing a community radio pro uh, project from the Dakotas, coming from Manitoba. Mm -hmm. And how can they interface with you guys? Well, you got my card. Um, if, if you want to, and it's a call-in call show, so anybody can participate in my show. They don't even need to give the free prior and informed consent. <laughs> just do it anytime they want. But, but certainly, if somebody wants to, uh, whether they physically come into the studio, which is always best, um, if they want to visit me in the studio, uh, by all means, reach out to me uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll arrange it. And, uh, and then I get promoted a little bit as well. But uh, if not, then just call me and we'll do a phone in. So. Uh, I know. If you, if you look up First Voice, it's the Indigenous Radio panels that were held at 530 and now, and the information on it, First Voice is Indigenous Radio.org. I'll put the where you can find the website and everything like that. Oh, by the way, First Voice is Indigenous Radio is now heard on 45 radio stations in North America. Mm -hmm. Only three of those are native, the rest of the country. Mm -hmm. and they're playing at prime time. So it, it's, it's, it's an addition to what they do, so it's a uh, compliment to you. And also, too, so if I can just reiterate the URL for my show, it's www.indigenouspolitics.com. I have an indigenouspolitics.org site, but it's not up and running yet. And I have a welcome message that has my email there. And the show is uh, broadcast on 11 stations through the Pacifica network through 10 states. And I'm happy to take it to any station that welcomes it. So if you're coming from around the country and know of a local station, one of the things that I do is I do it every other week. And my own home station alternates my show with Yoko's for the show. So there's many ways to do that where we're working together to try and make it so that that hour is on there immediately. So I, I like you, and I'll cut us off. I'm sorry, but the next panels coming in. Some of us are here already, so stay around for that. And uh, that's it. Thank you to Kale Lonnie and Jonathan.